guys, welcome to The Reading Stack. I'm Hunter, and today we're going to be starting our new segment called Shooting the Breeze, where we talk about these just urgent and important matters that uh, is going on in our culture or something that I feel is important to share with y'all, just my commentary. But also I want to share what other very wise people have said. Um, this uh, matter we'll be talking about tonight is one I think is very important, one that we all need help with, one that I've struggled with in my past, one that uh, just the humanity uh, definitely struggles with. And tonight what we're going to be talking about in episode one of Shooting the Breeze is naivete. Now, naivete is uh, the quality where the best way I put it is is uh, it can be referred to as being naive, of course, that's uh, that's where we get it from, being naive or simple. And uh, to be naive or simple, it means that we believe everything and we're discerning nothing. So to believe everything, but uh, to discern nothing. You see, naivete is a really big problem in our world and culture, and it hits us so easily as human beings because we embrace comfort. We often uh, don't go through the uh, mental rigors and the uh, to, to know, to learn uh, what we need to, to make better decisions, to reject certain ideas and to accept others. And uh, we also don't, morally we can struggle with it to where we might know the right thing but we avoid it because it's too hard for us to act on, too inconvenient. So we choose to remain simple, naive to certain situations or things, the true nature of things, and uh, we miss out on a lot. We uh, commit folly. Well, what I want to discuss with you is just a few examples of how we uh, can end up living naively. Um, so to start those off, I'm going to talk about, initially, <laughs> about the hardest thing, which is our politics and our beliefs and uh, this could be our belief systems but definitely politics I felt like is a good place uh, to begin this it's a very easy place where we commit um, commit folly and where we uh, can be naive and uh, I want to start this off with a quote um, from uh, the book Common Sense by Thomas Paine where on the very first page in his introduction he says that um, in talking about the American system at the time, people were um, doing essentially whatever the British crown wanted them to do, being subjugated, dealing with tyranny. And he says this, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. So I think the easiest way that we can find ourselves naive is we accept that the right way is the way things have always been, you know, that uh, there isn't a way we should seek out mentally that's better, and there isn't a way morally in our heart that we should commit to making things better, to changing things. And another way, I think this applies universally, but also politically, a very um, powerful illustration uh, that I should have queued up on the screen is this thing called the Overton Window. Now the Overton Window is this graph that shows um, two arrows splitting apart and on opposite ends of this spectrum of arrows there are the words unthinkable, unthinkable, and then in between that radical and closer to the middle is acceptable and then even closer is sensible and then finally in the middle of that Overton Window is what is popular and what is policy at the dead center. And what this shows is, is that um, these charts can be uh, that our beliefs, you know, things that used to be just in a genuine, just in a real like base uh, sociological way of looking at it. If you look at the 1920s, the way people wore swimsuits, that is unthinkable to us now. Like the amount of conservative, uh, values they had when it came to dress back then to us is just unthinkable and uh, 
2021 America. And also, um, you know, there was things very radical that were normal in culture. Used to, uh, you can take like the uh, 1800s, you know, the whole idea of people scalping people, you know, uh, the native tribes, um, to them something that was very <laughs> regular um, to us is uh, very abominable to do that if you heard um, of a, a soldier doing that nowadays you would look at him uh, like a psychopath you know but that was pretty normal in their culture and uh, definitely very scary for settlers uh, in any westerns or uh, anything of that nature you read or watch so just to say that our views can change based on what is introduced and what is present that uh, what we accept, you know, is we can accept the way things have always been as the way that they should be. Um, I did a book review on Amazing Grace with William Wilberforce, and he really talked about that. People in Britain where he was, a lot of them had never seen a slave, but out in the colonies, the British colonies, slavery was rampant, of course, and people accepted it because they hadn't seen the brutality and how... Um, vile it truly was, how corrupting, how many, just how fatal it was. You know, even the sailors that worked transporting the slaves, they died so much from like disease and it was just awful, very uh, vile. But people in Britain were very comfortable giving assent to it, that it's acceptable. And all he really had to do, it was a long struggle, but he just had to show people what slavery really looked like. And the British people were up in arms against it, and they uh, abolished it in the trade, I believe, abroad from Britain in 1812-ish, uh, around that time. And then in 1833, officially abolished, I think, slavery for good. So that was 30 years before uh, the Emancipation Proclamation in America. So people's opinion shifted based on what was introduced, what was being uh, pushed, you know, the agenda. And today, a lot of the stuff we're doing now may have been completely reprehensible or unfashionable 20 years ago. So that window changes. We can be naive and just accept that things are what they are and we can't change those or shouldn't look at things differently. But um, the opposite of being naive would to say, hey, these things can be different. You know, and being a Christian, a big view I hear about like, a political belief that Christians have is it's kind of this idea and maybe an anarchist or somebody else they'll not say <laughs> it's all gonna burn anyway so what should I care you know and I think that's a good justification for Christian apathy to say I won't get involved in my government you know I just won't uh, make that investment there to make things better to play my part and uh, just retracting from that I think it's very harmful um, for Christians and just the responsibility of scriptures like Romans 13 gives us to be active in government, to respect our authorities. But instead we just take the uh, distance view because it's easiest uh, intellectually and morally in our hearts. Uh, but we could be doing wrong, uh, committing what I'll talk about a little bit later, the sin of omission, not doing what we should. You know, there's a the popular expression with politics and beliefs the idea of taking the red pill as opposed to the blue pill, and you may remember that from the movie The Matrix. Whereas the red pill, uh, you take that and your eyes will be open, you'll see the truth, but it will be uncomfortable and painful. Whereas the blue pill that's also offered is to embrace uh, this blissful ignorance, not to see the truth, and uh, you know just to have this enjoyment, this relative peace, whereas the red pill really uh, would alarm you. and. Uh, I think too many of us, we take that blue pill. We live the naive life where we believe everything, we discern nothing because it's very uncomfortable when you see people you think maybe friend or foe, uh, beliefs you may have embraced may be false or very harmful. Yes, uh, naivety and political beliefs, you know, we could say, I believe this because so-and-so does, you know, my grandfather or whatever. And it's very easy just to let that sink in. You know, I believe, the best way, the healthy way, is will show uh, that protects us the most is to be very discerning, to, to weigh things in the scales and the balances. You know, and the best way to escape naivety 
in our politics and beliefs, I believe, is to read from the reading stack, uh, as, we, as our channel is about reading. Uh, you're gathering from these opposite viewpoints, just information that fights each other, that balances that out to give you a perspective on the way to look at things. To talk to other people, you know, and that's something that's so hard today, I think, because just over several years, we've had just a polarization of opinions where people are so far apart in their worldviews and their basic understanding of everything. <laughs> people today through social media, I think more than ever, um, as opposed to a marketplace of ideas, like maybe it was design, we have found ways to create echo chambers of maybe conservative voices, liberal voices, Christian voices, atheist voices, you know, across any type of spectrum, you know, the vegan side and then the, we're the meat eaters, um, where there's not that healthy dialogue, that coming together for common understanding, where people really lay it out, you know, but there can be a lot of bashing back and forth. And just to say, there is places where dialogue does happen, but those places aren't getting the huge following you know it's easy to be naive it's easy to go straight for the echo chambers and not be in the place that challenges our mind and our heart uh, to act to grow and i think in our education system i know growing up in public school here in arkansas um, i think our rhetoric and our debate were left a long time ago to die a sad death it just never seemed like it was a big deal like let's let's really challenge uh each other and just know how to formulate arguments, how to learn to talk, you know. It's more of something I think you'd learn at university in a law class, you know, how to do cross-examinations and closing remarks, uh, needing those things. And I think also subjectivization has grown, and that is a big word. It just means that where everyone's opinion is never seen as having truth involved in it, they're just merely sentiments. You know, it's really uh, saying that your sentiments are divorced from reality. You know, I've talked with people and they say, well, that's just how you feel about it, you know. And when you're there, you can never get through like a consensus, you know. It's just you have your sentiments and I have mine. And uh, I think that's just a very harmful uh harmful place where we really don't say anything has a object objective value. Nothing's really founded in truth, you know, like, for instance, the, the death penalty is a belief, you know. People will say, well, that's what you prefer, and that's what I prefer, and it's right, you know. Out appealing to reality and truth, um, as opposed above sentiments, you'll never, um, that's what we should prize, truth. What is true for me? Two plus two equals four. And as much as we could wish it equals five, uh, it's gonna stop short of five. Another thing in politics and beliefs, as a Christian, just speaking, I think uh, faith is, the word and the term faith is something that's so misconstrued to be something it's not. Maybe on more of the charismatic side of Christianity, and not all, not all is to owe to, to that side just to say, but faith has kind of seemed like it's something that can make you naive, where it's like, take me at my word, believe blindly, um, and that's not what faith is. Faith is actually reason supported, and it's like believing, I have faith in my friend because he's been faithful in the past to do X, you know, or I'm faithful in the chair I'm sitting on because it's never broken down on me before, you know, but a lot of times, Faith is like, you know, playing that uh, game of roulette, you know, it's wishful thinking, it's not, uh, reason is out of the equation, you know, it's just, we're hoping, but it's not grounded in something like, you know, as the Christian would see, the character of God in the past for the future, or um, faith, faith is just so misconstrued that uh, people can give you a real simple thing that says, believe me blindly. And as we know what we said before, the simple or the naive believe everything and discern nothing. So it's literally that belief is there, but there's no discernment. There's no reasons for or really against, you know, to, to, and to make a decision from that. So as a Boethius, the middle-aged philosopher said, he said, as far as possible, join faith to reason. And uh, the best thing with politics and beliefs, if you read The Republic, 
you know, I don't agree with everything in uh, Plato's Republic, which I have on the shelf behind me, but they talked about so much in there. It's just amazing of asking questions to come to a consensus. I think that's the best way to have discussion. You know, that's one of the founders really of Western thought. And it's one of the reasons I think our civilization and culture has thrived because the basis of our reason, of our dialogue has been uh, hopefully from that to be Socratic, you know, to ask, to convince, to win somebody. But the best way I think is to ask people questions to where they come to the truth through their own searching. And as someone said, uh, a question mark is almost like a fishing hook like it hooks us in and we don't realize it whereas you know uh, it just statements can repel people but if you say well what do you think about this or why why is that so that that can build us along to coming to know the truth ultimately i hope i've said something about politics and beliefs that's resonated with you just not to believe that everything is right because it's the way it's always been not to be apathetic um and to want to go beyond those echo chambers and just to grow um, and beliefs to always think of reason, to have reason to, uh, you know, have support, not just blind faith. So I hope that has helped um, just to consider about maybe political and spiritual and just other uh, beliefs that may be affected by naivety, naivete, sorry. And uh, next we're going to talk about relationships where naivete and simple mindedness can occur. And I want to talk about relationships in the individual and in the corporate sense. You know, individual meaning just maybe a friendship, a relationship, and then corporate could be you to an organization, a church, or to a job, uh, something along those lines. Well, let me tell you a short story of, you know, I had a really good friend that probably the friend I had for the longest for, in my life, you know, through school, from junior high uh, to college. and. Uh, I would go over to hang out at his house with um, with his dad, his dad's house, and uh, you know his dad was kind of, uh, I guess you could say, loose in the head. Um, he took a lot of medication to help that. Well, um, I, was, I was like, oh, it'll never be that bad, you know. Though I knew he was kind of uh, a little bit unstable. But I went over there one day, and to make you know the long story short. Um, he was, you know, unhinged, and uh, he had took my friend, you know, that was his son, and had, like, just, you know, was choking the lights out of him, and he had a gun in his hand and stuck it, you know, to my head, and was uh, threatening both of us, you know, to punk us out. He thought I was somebody else, you know. He was really just calling me a different name, you know. It's really unhinged, you know. And all that to say, when that happened, my friend... He realized, hey, I have to stay away from my dad. Like, he was crazy. And he had realized, hey, I need to quit. <laughs> you know, he convinced me it would be no problem or whatever. But, it, you know, it's definitely a life-threatening, scary, uh, hazardous situation. So you realize when you're in a bad, tox you know, toxic thing like that, you need to cut off contact. You need to get away when it's a life-threatening situation. But not all the time when it's life-threatening, you need to make a change. You know, I want to share uh, the first verse in the Psalms, in Psalm 1-1, it says this just to add, uh, add meaning to that about relationships and their importance. It says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers? So it's saying that our happiness is connected to our relationships and who we listen to for advice, who we stand around with, who we sit in the company of. Who you hang with is going to determine how you are. You know, if you're ill or healthy, your relationships are so important. So you can't be naive there and end up with somebody that is evil or, uh, or very toxic for you. You know, many organizations and people could be in a relationship. They, there's different manipulation tactics out there that exist, such as love bombing, where you just uh, say, hey, we love you. You know, people that just pursue you constantly and you you feel good because you get their acceptance, whatever. So you make these concessions like, oh, this organization isn't a cult or these people, it's a healthy relationship because you feel good. 
but you may not know that they have like an insidious plan um, lurking, something unhealthy that's damaging for you. you know, somebody could be sociopathic, so that you can be brought in by those, somebody could threaten you, to, you know, to coerce you, or, you know, like, I knew a guy I went to church with that was a former a Jehovah's Witness, and he was really into it growing up, you know, very uh, prominent in that, but he wanted to marry a woman that was outside of the Jehovah's Witness Witnesses, and they threatened him, but he went through with it, and when he went through with it, his family and just everybody he had known had said, we'll never contact you again, you'll just, well, we'll never normally contact you again, but you'll receive a call when each of us dies. And he said, you know, that every time somebody that was close to him died, he would just get a real quick, you know, 10 second phone call just to let him know that. But the truth is they basically had, uh, in a sense, like excommunicated him, shunned him, wouldn't let him see his family and friends as a tactic. It's a tactic to get you, keep you emotionally involved in there. You know, you still want to see your loved ones and your friends and whatnot, but it can just really mess with you to make you desire to want to go back, you know, and, and that's just very unhealthy. And if you're naive, if you're not using the courage to know, to learn, to say, hey, I'm being, you know, messed with psychologically, or the heart, you know, the courage that says, I need to walk away from this, then naively you'll stay in something uh, that's harmful or dangerous for you. You know, something's wrong with it if they have to resort to that to get you to stay along. And I think a good thing to get you over relational naivete in uh, individual relationships and corporate relationships is to study, you know, to read books on what healthy relationships are like, but also to study the manipulation tactics that people would use to protect you from them uh, relationally. And, you know, it's naivete to believe that a person that maybe you care about or, or an organization you care about that's uh, messed up in a way that they'll change, you know, that's naivete and wishful thinking. And sometimes the best way to change that situation, and maybe even that person or organization maybe, is to put in your resignation to leave the equation. So, so I think that's vital to think about, to have that courage just to think about your relationships and to look at them, try to look at objectively as you can. Because the scripture I said, it says, how happy is the one who doesn't walk, stand, or sit in their company, you know, if they're bad, you know, you, you deserve something better than that. So don't be naive in relationships. Always think, think about the, try to be discerning, not to just believe everything. And uh, business, business naivete. Now one uh, thing to consider is, am I an easy mark? Are you, are you an easy mark for someone to scam, to uh, pull one over on? There's just predatory wolves out there um, that they're looking to con you, to scheme you, to rob you, uh, to take you know your livelihood away. I remember one person had quoted from a book on being a con man, and they said, to be conned, you need a touch of larceny in your own heart, which means that you want to have a desire for thievery in your own heart or to make to bring in the bank so when somebody comes up to you and they have a you know a half-baked scheme or some sort of thing you know get rich quick scheme because you have that desire for greed or money so strong to appreciate money there's i don't think there's anything wrong with that but when it gets too much you'll be gullible be taken in to believe everything someone says and to be duped, to lose out. My grandma, for instance, she always gets calls from, well, I'll just say countries probably around the Indian Ocean, Southern Hemisphere area, and it says, uh, you know, mister, your computer is broken, let me fix it. You know, and they want you to go in your computer and do all the stuff that uh, plays right into their favor. So that's one bad way you can be duped. Somebody can mess with your computer because you've given them access. That's what they need. They, you have to give consent or you have to give money. People are trying to get your heart involved 
to go along with. And you see the American Greed show that comes on and you just see so many people get bought in with pyramid schemes where somebody says, hey, you want to make a lot of money? Um, and they can give someone what they want, which is a little bit of money. And they do that to get that person's heart, you know, I guess massaged in their favor, you know, manipulate them, go all in and just uh, drain their accounts or harm them financially. So if someone's doing that to you, how do you not be naive? The best way, I think, is to try to cut through the butter, to ask the hard questions to somebody. You know, when you're when that person calls from the Southern Hemisphere and they want in your computer, you say, hey, wait, what? What am I doing again? You know, ask questions because they're trained to say, hey, this is a dead end. This ain't gonna work out. You know, this person is too rational minded, too assertive. Um, but you do have to be assertive, you know, you have have to have to be wise. I think some of my best um, <laughs> advice I would give people is to look poor uh, as much as you can, that uh, it detracts people away. If people say, hey, this guy has, you know, disposable income, this person is uh, living it up, then you're great, you know, you're a big game to get, you know, millions out of or whatever. And so just look for, be, be okay with that, not to, not to entice people all the time with your great money, you know, keep, keep that stuff on, on the low and uh, also be content, you know, that's where people, people want to appeal to someone's discontent, someone that wants a lot more money for retirement or a lot more money for their standard of living and they get duped that way and just play it smart do your research you know look at the better business bureau um, what they say about companies look at look at reviews and what people are saying and just consider that you know if it's uh, somebody to teach you about real estate or or whatever it could be just really not to believe everything but to uh, but to discern everything, you know, not to discern nothing. And a book I have here that's great on that is, uh, it's by Maurice LeBlanc, it's uh, Arsene Lupin. It's a uh, great, it's kind of like Sherlock Holmes a little bit, but the character is a gentleman thief. And you may have seen the manga slash anime that's, uh, that I really have enjoyed, uh, Lupin the Third, where he's the grandson of uh, Art. Arsene Lupin in that book, but the, the base thing he does is he's so bold as to tell these people, hey, I'm coming for your treasure, and he show well, and he says, I'll do it exactly at 8 p.m., and so everybody's looking, you know, for uh, Lupin, everyone's ready for him, police are on standby, but what he does is he disguises himself as somebody that is trustworthy as somebody that the people have complete trust in and then he's able to go in and steal the jewels or the artifact or whatever it could be you see that's the thing is trust is what people need to get you in business and for people to do business with you they probably need to trust you you know if people don't trust you as a construction contractor or whatever the matter could be, they won't give you access into their home to do the job you need to. Uh, trust is so vital, and that's what these con men or thieves is the book. They need trust, and uh, that's how they get one over on you. So always be careful, discerning, especially about how you give your trust out. And the, and the last example I want to use that I, is one I see that, that bothers me so much, and that's the matter of personal security. People have naivete with their personal security first because they have that apathy factor. They just, uh, whatever happened will be, you know, que sera, sera. They have the idea somebody else will protect me, either my relative or my friend or the police most commonly, uh, the legal system, you know, and that leaves people's uh, flanks exposed because they don't take their own responsibility for their safety to uh, protect themselves uh, from armed people, from people that just are crafty. They don't want to have the vigilance, the naivete is believing I'm safe, you know, believing everything, but discerning nothing, not being able to discern a threat or a risk. You know, one of the number one things I've seen from people that are a victim of rape is that you would think if someone was a rapist, you would need a lot of force to uh, get somebody to quit, you know. But the thing is, most people that are uh, rapists, they 
believe they'll get an eager victim or a non-resistant victim. So the best thing, you know, in all self-defense I've seen is to <laughs> inflict as much pain on them as possible, you know, to show I'm not willing or eager or um, non-resistance, but to say, you know, you're violent, to do as much damage as you possibly can. And that takes, you know, preparation of mind, preparation of, you know, having a... <laughs> a gun or pepper spray um, but so many people are gullible and thinking the world's all good you know with their personal safety but you know as a Christian the belief is, is that man is fallen man is evil you give man power and opportunity to exploit and they will you know so and even this by Saint Augustine who was a uh, you know a very notable Christian in 400 AD or so he's he says this Though defensive violence will always be a sad necessity in the eyes of men of principle, it would be still more unfortunate if wrongdoers should dominate just or righteous men. You see, that's the thing is, is you need to take your safety and the safety of others seriously, your family, your neighbors, your friends, because when once you protect, you're implicitly saying this has value and what you just leave defenseless, it implicitly says this is unimportant. Just like people value and protect their time, like, hey, I'm eating supper, leave me alone, or I'm unavailable right now. It says that's important not to be violated, and we say stuff is important by protecting it, that it has value. So protection is a good thing safety, security, it's peace, you know, as, as the Bible even says, it's literally the idea of shalom, is calm, peace, you know. And as I spoke a little bit earlier, mentioned the sin of omission. It's the sin of not doing anything, you know, and that's what people have with their apathy of personal security. The gullibility that everything will just be okay, just play along, don't, don't rock the boat. The sin of omission is when we do nothing. In doing nothing, it can be wrong and sometimes, you know, our legal system supports this with tort laws, you know, that we can harm people by doing nothing, by basically, um, if we leave a giant hole on the edge of our yard and don't fill that in and a kid falls in and gets hurt, we, we are liable for like negligence, that negligence, that neglect, just doing nothing. In the eyes of God, we're held accountable, and in the eyes of the law, a lot of times we're held accountable for doing nothing. We have to protect ourselves. We have to consider it, you know, and that's just the way I see people have apathy and naivete. Nothing bad will happen to me. I don't need to do martial arts uh, or have any know-how in that realm. I don't need to have, like, security systems for my house. I don't need to know how to use a gun or the laws in using a gun properly versus improperly. And so when you just have that naivete that you just believe everything's gonna be good and you don't, you're not discerning that there are threats in this world, there are wolves out there, we're responsible to protect ourselves and to protect what we have, uh, then you'll fall prey and it'll be damaging. So naivete is no good uh, with your personal security. Jesus, he says himself in Matthew 10, 16, he says, I am sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And that wisdom of serpents, you know, to protect yourself, to, uh, to be aware of what's lurking, the threats. You know, to get past our own naivete, in closing, we have to first admit that we are more naive than we would ever want to be. When we know and realize that we're mentally and probably volitionally vulnerable, when we know we're naive in certain way, it allows us to shore up our defenses. But if we're just callous and we say, no, we're not uh, naive, uh, everything's all right with our thinking and with our living, then we'll never shore up our defenses to become stronger, to uh, become less vulnerable. And so I just want to ask you, just as we close, like, are you vulnerable in your beliefs? You know, how do you just discern and determine if something is true or false? Are you vulnerable in your relationships? You know, how do you discern if you're in a healthy or unhealthy relationship or organization? You know, there's some people, you know, that just can't get their way out of a bad organization, a bad relationship. 
It can be the apathy of not wanting to change. It can be that lack of awareness. And you know, you definitely don't want to be in something unhealthy or toxic, damaging. Um, another thing is, are you in a place where you could be financial prey? You know, how do you know if something's legit and reliable? Or if something's shady and fly by night? You know, what warning signs would you think of? Are you in potential personal danger? What would you do if someone broke in your home in the middle of the night? I think that's a good question. And it always makes us stronger to consider those scenarios of how do we protect ourselves if. It's not uh, for fear mongering. It's not to make ourselves sweat, release cortisol, stress hormone, and whimper, you know, cower. But we need to think about what do we do if. Because if we do that, we can prepare contingencies. We can get stronger. But if we just don't know the risk or the vulnerabilities, we'll, we'll fall prey somehow, some way. To fix our naivete, we simply have to fix two problems. And I've kind of went into that earlier tonight. We have to fix an intellectual problem and a moral problem. The intellectual problem is simply, do I desire to know what I don't know? Do I desire to know? Like, would I want to be able to see the wolves, you know, the predators in life? That's a scary sight to see, but we have to ask ourselves, do I, do I desire to know? To know what's best, to know what's good, true, beautiful. To know what's true, we have to know what's false. And to know what's good, we have to know what's bad. So, do we desire to know? And also the moral problem is, uh, do I desire to act on this knowledge I received? If I knew I was vulnerable, would I change that? If I knew, if you know you need to grow, would you? If you knew you were in a, an untrue or false belief system, or if you knew you were following the wrong political party, would you act on that knowledge? Would you make a change? You know, I think those are just really big philosophical questions. Do we desire to know? Do we desire to act? Um, resources, I think, for overcoming naivete are pretty simple. I think one great resource is the book of Proverbs and the Bible, since it discusses so much about simple people, fools, um, wise people, understanding people, good, evil, wicked, um, righteous. It's just a great book of literature and it covers so much on uh, how we can leave being simple and naive behind. Also YouTube, there's so many good counter arguments and different perspectives we can see uh, that could challenge our thinking, but we need to seek those out. So I think YouTube right here is a great place to look for uh, things that would challenge our thinking and uh, sharpen our minds and help us to leave naivete just by the different uh, content creators out there. And I hope my video has helped you in some way, just shooting the breeze, talking about some things. And any book you read is going to make you sharper and smarter more discerning. So I encourage you to read as always. And I uh, thank y'all so much for tuning in to the Reading Stack and listening to our first episode of Shooting the Breeze. And, uh, you know, I hope you have a great day and uh, leave. let's leave all naivete behind. Check you later. Bye.